The year is 2002, and US Navy Admiral Vernon Clark watches in awe as his Danish colleagues hoist a large gun off a pier with a crane and install it on their ship, replacing a previously installed instrument. In 40 minutes, they had swapped weapons, allowing their platform to easily adapt to a new mission. That simple demonstration and Clark's interpretation of it would change the future of America's Navy, but not for the better. Here is the multi-decade story of how the US Navy spent billions on a program that many of its sailors derisively call the Little Crappy Ship. Despite the objections of several secretaries of defense, some of the Navy's best officers, and an unconventional president who promised that he would drain the swamp. After Clark saw the Danish demonstration, he envisioned a new class of ship. The ships would be small, manned by about 40 sailors, and most importantly, adaptable. If the mission was an anti-submarine one, the ship could be outfitted with the necessary equipment. If the mission became a mine-clearing one, the sailors would simply need to swap out the anti-submarine equipment for the mine-clearing gear. If ship-to-ship -ship combat was required, there was equipment for that too. This new type of ship, the littoral combat ship LCS, would serve as something almost akin to the Navy's Swiss Army knife. It would be easy to change the parts as each mission required, which would over the long haul save the Navy billions of dollars because there would be less of a need to build specialized ships for each mission. Ships are expensive. One ship capable of doing multiple tasks would lessen the need for the construction of additional, specialized ships. However, as the old saying goes, jack of all trades, master of none. Red flags showed up as soon as Clark began talking about his idea. There were skeptics in the Navy and Congress that the LCS would ever be feasible. For example, Clark insisted that the new ship would need to feature speed as one of its top assets. 45 knots was the ideal. However, this level of speed meant that the ship would be a gas guzzler in need of constant refueling, limiting its range. Meanwhile, the ship's small size meant that there would be limitations on the amount of weapons it could carry. Additionally, the ships would have to sacrifice protection to achieve the level of speed that the Admiral envisioned. Clark did not seem disturbed by this, since he believed carrying too much armor would make the ships too heavy to operate near the shore, which was their primary mission. He also reportedly laughed off the idea that a ship of any kind could survive an impact with a modern weapon, like an anti-ship cruise missile. So what was the point of such heavy armor anyway? Other officers and members of Congress were much more uneasy with this proposition. To them, Clark's argument veered dangerously close to limiting the value of protecting sailors' lives. Despite these conceptual problems, the Navy decided to go ahead with the littoral combat ship albeit with some modifications, such as better armor. Here's where the problems really began. The price tag started to rise when construction commenced, jumping from a proposed $220 million per ship to $500 million per ship. This reality immediately questioned the fundamental notion that the ships would be inexpensive. Two companies were awarded contracts to build the prototype littoral combat ships. The first was Lockheed Martin, and the second was a partnership between General Dynamics and Orstal an Australian shipbuilder. Lockheed Martin's vessel would become the USS Freedom class, while the General Dynamics or Starship partnership would produce the USS Independence class. This is where things got really bad for the LCS program. The two ships were of radically different designs. The Freedom was a conventional steel monohull, while the Independence was a trimaran design built of aluminium. The different setups meant that the ships would not be able to exchange parts, they would require completely different training programs to operate too, so sailors could not easily go from one type of ship to another. Unable to decide which of the two ships it would ultimately go along with, the Navy decided on the option that was the worst of all worlds. It would choose both. General Dynamics or Style's shipyard would be based in Alabama, while Lockheed Martins would be in Wisconsin. This decision ensured the costs of the LCS program would balloon even more. The effort that was supposed to lower the ship's price tag, having two companies build the vessel and get into a competitive bidding war, had instead raised it. This decision largely came from then-Secretary of the Navy Ray Mabus in the fall of 2010. Despite increasing objections from the US Navy's brass, Mabus was the LCS program's chief champion at the time. The decision was also partly political. Mabus wanted to win the support of congressional delegations from Alabama and Wisconsin, who would naturally see the program as a source of jobs for their respective constituents. For a former governor of Mississippi, politics was a natural calculation. For Mabus, the ends justified the means. He was convinced that the Navy needed more ships, an opinion which has been influential to this day. 
The thinking was that more ships would be needed to combat the growing size of China's navy and Russia's new submarine program. Thus, the LCS program went ahead, but the critics remained. In 2012, Rear Admiral Sam Perez was tasked with writing a report about how to best use the littoral combat ships, which were now under construction. The report was anything but flattering about the program's prospects, though it was not particularly unique. The same flaws resurfaced. The crew sizes were too small, the weapon systems would not be so easily interchangeable, and the ship's respective class designs were too different. Perez paid for his skepticism, as his report was hidden from the public eye and he was transferred to obscure posts. His fate encouraged other skeptics of the LCS program to stay silent. The shipbuilding went ahead, but when the first vessels started to come online in the mid-2010s, the projected problems became embarrassing realities. For example, in November 2015, the USS Milwaukee, a Freedom-class LCS, set out on its maiden voyage. It would be journeying from its shipyard on Lake Michigan in Wisconsin onward to San Diego, and eventually to the increasingly contested Indo-Pacific region in a triumphal display for the LCS program. Unfortunately, the ship wouldn't even make it halfway to San Diego. That December, a software glitch led to damage in the Milwaukee's engine. The combining gear, a mechanism that connects gas turbines and diesel engines to the ship's propulsion system, was damaged as a result of the glitch, and the Milwaukee needed to be towed into the port at Norfolk, Virginia for repairs. Combining gear failure became a recurrent theme in other Freedom-class littoral combat ships too. In December 2022, the Navy was still negotiating with Lockheed Martin over who should pay what for fixing persistent combining gear problems. As of November 2021, the costs were split 50-50. The Milwaukee's problems were hardly surprising to many officials in the Pentagon. In 2014, then-Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel tried to slow down the LCS program, reducing the number of purchased ships to 32 from 52. In turn, he wanted a new frigate design that would essentially make the LCS useless, but bureaucratic maneuvering ensured he did not succeed. Ashton Carter, who replaced Hagel in the Pentagon's top post, also wanted to reduce the number of LCS vessels to 40 from 52. Mabus again resisted his boss, even as the ships were breaking down in real time. A month after the USS Milwaukee fiasco, the USS Fort Worth, another Freedom-class LCS, suffered mechanical failures. Coming off an otherwise successful exercise in the Indo-Pacific region, the Fort Worth saw hundreds of gallons of fuel leak into its main machine room. The sailors aboard the ship needed to spray a chemical foam onto the fuel to prevent fires from breaking out. After that, they had to struggle in filth to clean up the mess, often in tight spaces with rags and pumps, according to a report in ProPublica. A week later, when the Fort Worth docked in Singapore, the crew discovered numerous other leaks, and the engines and electrical generators needed heavy maintenance. The already exhausted crew needed to work even harder. Pressure from upstairs mounted for the Fort Worth to be ready to visit Hong Kong on January 12, 2016, but there was another combining gear failure. The Fort Worth was unable to complete the rest of its mission. A third embarrassing failure for the LCS program would occur six months later. In July 2016, the USS Freedom, the ship that gave its name to the class, also suffered an embarrassing failure. The day before it was set to take part in a high-profile exercise that officials saw as crucial for the reputation of the LCS program. Unfortunately, the ship couldn't even leave port due to a different type of engine failure than that seen on the Milwaukee months earlier. This time, a cannon plug malfunctioned. Without it, the ship's complicated engine could not work. A replacement cannon plug needed to be driven in from an hour north of Las Vegas through civilian traffic. Then, when the ship was finally departed on the night of July 11th, a leak inside the main machine room sprayed sensitive electronic equipment with seawater. When sailors on board finally managed to plug the leak, this too backfired. As the water was diverted through the seal that was supposed to keep it out of the ship's oil lubrication system, the water mixed with the oil to produce a sludge that went through one of the ship's engines the ship was forced to return to San Diego. To ensure that the Freedom could participate in that year's Rim of Pacific RIMPAC, exercise, the naval brass determined that the ship would be able to use its three remaining engines if a special rinse was used to block further corrosion. After the failures of the Milwaukee and another ship, the Fort Worth, which had sprung leaks in an earlier exercise, the political pressure for Freedom to participate in the RIMPAC exercise was immense. The Freedom was able to do this, detecting water mines, but in the process, its engine was so damaged that it needed to be docked for repairs for two years. Repairs on the LCS program have also been complicated, 
as the military contractors that built them consider much of its components on the ship as their exclusive intellectual property. This legal distinction limited the extent to which sailors could repair the ships, and instead required specialist employees from the companies to do what sailors were not permitted to. These people needed to be flown out to the damaged ships, adding to the costs and time delays of the already troubled program. The weapons and equipment on board the LCS vessels have fared little better than their mechanical conditioning. The highly touted anti-submarine warfare capability of the LCS proved so ineffective that the Navy cancelled that part of the program entirely in 2022. The sonar equipment the ship dragged through the water couldn't communicate with the ship's other systems, and the Freedom class of LCS was found to be too loud to effectively pursue an anti-submarine mission. The anti-mine system experienced similar failures. In March 2016, the remote mine hunting system had to be cancelled after 15 years and $700 million invested. The system frequently returned false positives and proved difficult for sailors to operate. The Navy turned to different ways to hunt mines, such as the Airborne Laser Mine Detection System and the Airborne Mine Neutralization System. These systems can be deployed from an LCS, as seen in a 2019 exercise in the Baltic Sea. Still, this was an almost Hail Mary effort for the struggling program, as the Navy is now looking for a new systems-based approach to anti-mine operations that involve mostly unmanned aerial, surface, and undersea assets – drones. So even if some of the drones can be deployed from an LCS, it's far from certain that the vessel is needed for the mission it was supposed to be such an integral part of. The LCS program reportedly caused as much damage to the morale of its sailors as it did to the ships of the US Navy. The LCS vessel's frequent breakdowns ensured that many of the sailors and officers assigned to them often spent more hours on land than they did at sea, wasting away years of what should have been valuable experience in the process. When they were at sea, sailors spent a large amount of their time doing repairs, which, as we've seen, could often involve filthy manual labor instead of mission preparedness. Crews on littoral combat ships were so small in number that even commanding officers aboard these vessels sometimes had to pitch in and do the grunt work like sweeping ship decks. These factors have led to a high attrition rate for sailors in the LCS program, as almost none volunteered to come back once their stints aboard the vessels had come to an end. By the end of the Obama administration, the problems in the LCS program had become so apparent and overwhelming that many observers in Washington expected the incoming Trump administration to finally end it. After all, President Trump had campaigned on draining the Washington swamp. This did not turn out to be the case. By 2017, the Navy's focus was on building the new type of frigate that Hargill had originally proposed three years earlier. With this new focus in mind, the Navy had requested only one new LCS to be delivered for the year 2017. However, the Navy would not get its wishes, despite the Trump administration's skepticism to the LCS program. When she heard that the LCS program might be scaled back in 2017, Senator Tammy Baldwin DWI, wrote a letter to Trump on May 12th of that year, reminding him that he had promised to expand the Navy's size to 350 ships. To reach that number, she said it was essential to include the 52 vessels originally slated for the LCS program. The LCS is a quintessential Made in America program, Baldwin wrote. More than 2,200 hardworking men and women are directly employed at the shipyard in Marinette, Wisconsin, building the Freedom Class LCS, with another approximately 4,700 jobs throughout its supply chain and in the communities of my home state. The letter was mostly political rather than military in nature. Nevertheless, the Trump administration then requested $500 million for another LCS that the Navy did not want. The next year, Congress dispensed enough funds to produce a total of 35 littoral combat ships, three more than the Navy demanded. The price tag was $1.5 billion. Trump had little choice. One of his major campaign promises was to buy American and hire American. Additionally, Wisconsin was one of the three critical Great Lakes battleground states that swung his way and delivered the White House to him in 2016. It would be just as critical a battleground in the next election. Keeping the state in his column would be necessary for his political survival, which meant that this special interest would need to be placated. Politics had prevailed again. With Wisconsin's battleground status unlikely to ebb, in the coming presidential election cycles, pressure to continue the LCS program will continue on the Biden and future administrations, no matter which political party they belong to. In the end, littoral combat ships have proven so unreliable that the Navy has begun to retire and mothball them decades ahead of schedule. The first four LCS vessels, the USS Freedom, Independence, Fort Worth, and Coronado, 
were all retired on March 31, 2021. The Coronado was less than six years old. A year later, the Navy announced its intentions to retire nine more littoral combat ships because of their inability to carry out their original anti-submarine mission. However, lobbying efforts on Capitol Hill met with congressional delegations from LCS host states to ensure that only four of them would hit the naval scrapyard in 2022. Meanwhile, in 2023, two more littoral combat ships are on the Navy's desired chopping block. One of them is the USS Jackson, which only had its maiden deployment in October 2022. The Freedom Class LCS in particular has proven to be a target for the Navy's chopping block, as the type of engine problems seen on the ship that gave its name to the class have proven common across the other vessels that followed it. Combining gear and other engine failures are an epidemic among them. In 2021, a fix to the frequent combining gear problem on the Freedom Class LCS was proposed. The problem is that the fix would require a deep retrofitting of the Freedom Class LCS's very design architecture. LCS Deputy Program Manager Howard Burke said of it in an interview for USNI News that it's a very complex fix to replace the bearings on the combining gear. It's a very tight space. There are a lot of interferences that have to be removed. This proposed maintenance across all of the remaining Freedom Class ships would take years. The Navy seems to have concluded that it would be better to scrap the design altogether. The Independence class ships have had better luck of late, as these vessels have proven capable of hosting the Navy's new anti-ship cruise missiles, making them potential components of surface combat missions. Despite this, the Independence class ships have still not been heavily deployed. Although they are considered more reliable than their counterparts, the Independence ships have had frequent cracks in their hulls. The design flaws ensure that many of them remain in port and away from strategic fronts. For example, neither of the two types of LCS vessels have ever been deployed to the Middle East, which for a long time the Navy said would be an ideal theatre for them. The LCS vessels, which were meant to save money in the long run, now each cost about as much as an Ali Burke-class destroyer. You can be the judge of the value each one brings for the dollar. With the new and much more capable Constellation-class frigate now under construction in the same Wisconsin shipyard as the Freedom-class LCS, politics may soon catch up with reality although that's not clear yet. There is often reluctance among members of Congress to end outdated programs. So many professional reputations have been invested into the LCS that it may find it hard to admit failure. The LCS program is almost a perfect example of how the politics of special interest and the sunk cost fallacy can cause irrational behavior and decisions that harm the public interest. The literal combat ship is certainly not the first boondoggle in the history of the United States Armed Forces, nor, unfortunately, will it be the last. But it is a highly visible and relevant one. Many national security experts fear the program's failure and the resources invested in it have further eroded the United States' traditional military advantage in the Indo-Pacific region, as China's People's Liberation Army Navy continues to increase the quality and quantity of its vessels. It may be that, historically, the little crappy ship was one of the costliest blind alleys in the history of American arms development. But what do you think of the Littoral Combat Ship Program? Don't forget to let us know in the comment section. Also hit the like button and be sure to subscribe to the channel for more military analysis from military experts.